eyes are a little bit more open than they were before. We it, still it, have the apple if anyone wants it. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Okay, all right. So, order in the court. Order in the court. All right. Okay, so now this is the last leg of this event. And uh, what we are doing right now is we are getting this big fire pit, whatever we decided to call it, the, the ground pit fire gathering situation. We're getting that set up right now in the back. So please join us for the big fire pit gathering situation. Um, the children can go now. I know that some of the children are kind of antsy and ready to go, and that's okay. And, and if you are and you want to go back there and you want to walk around, that's, that's perfectly fine. We do have one more amazing presentation, and this is going to be an important one that I don't want you guys to miss. So if you can stick around, please do so. Um, I also wanted to bring up that uh, if, you guys, if, you, if you guys believe in the mission, Advent Age missions, and our ministry, please, um, we would very much appreciate donations. Donations help these events be free, and they help very, very much. Otherwise, yeah, because because we're we're paying for this. This is the one. Yes, absolutely, you can do Zell and and different things. Uh, I believe that we actually. Still have Little, Little Eye Studios and these guys up from last time, but you can also see our information if you're interested. Uh, PayPal and, and Ad and Age Missions. Can you over give there. us a number you can zell it to? Yes, you can zell it to uh, my phone number, 817 344 and I can give that to you uh, later. And I think, and I'll put it on the board as well, so, so it, it'll, yeah, yeah, we'll put it on. I do have my number online, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, brother? Did you have something to say? Okay. All right, and also I wanted to bring, uh, bring light to Brother Paul. Where's Brother Paul? Brother Paul has a ministry also in the back, and I don't want you guys to miss this. Literature evangelist, Cole Porter. Uh, they they uh, survive off of their, the, the, the money that they make. Uh, selling the books. So please go take a look at his, uh, it, and I'm sure you guys have already seen it when we were out there eating. He has a little corner. So yeah, please help support him. Uh, another, just a reminder, we have uh, Music Fest in two weeks, and we have uh, all the flyers right there by, the, by the, uh, uh, the, this pew right here by the door. So we have flyers. Pick up a flyer, check it out. It has all the information you need. And um, yes, so... We're going to be doing like s'mores and things like that. So according to your own convictions, if you want to eat, if you don't want to, that's up to you. So um, that's going to be there. We have a limited supply. Um, I think that's everything. Are we ready to get going with the last session? Yes. Are we? Yeah. I am. I hope you are too. Okay, great. Brother, take over from here. Amen. Amen. Could we, hey, could I, could I, could we say a prayer because this is uh, Halloween weekend as well. It's not just Reformation Day weekend. This is Halloween weekend. There are a lot of evil things that are taking place all around us. Unspeakable things. Unspeakable things. All these things that we saw up here, these are making fun of things that are actually happening. These things are, there's actual satanic sacrifices that are happening to young children and people that we would be horrified. We would never, we would never ever say another joke in our lives if we knew what was really happening. We would be sobered up enough and we would just get to work. So please, can, can you join me in prayer for those less fortunate who are not here tonight with us? Please. Let's pray. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters. Let's pray for those who do not understand what they're involved in. That God will 
began a stronger work through us and in general so that our eyes might be opened and that their eyes might be opened and that we might have more wisdom to be able to reach those we love and strangers, those we don't even know. Let's pray, shall we? Please. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you. We thank you because you have not left us ignorant. You have not left us ignorant. Thank you for those who have spent their hard time with these presentations, sharing with us so that we will not be deceived. Sharing with us information about prophecy, about the Protestant Reformation, the principles, the origins of Halloween. Lord, there are people that we love, that we care about, those we don't even know, but that we want to reach. And Lord, we want you to give us wisdom and grace, and we want you to help us to reach them. Lord, you promised wisdom for those who ask in James 1.5. We are coming together as a body of believers, asking collectively for wisdom. Not just for us, but for the church. Lord, that you might give us wisdom, that we might know how to reach these lost souls. Or those souls who are just genuinely misunderst misunderstanding what is going on. Lord, we come before you boldly, but also humbly. We need your help. This church needs your help. Yes. Help this church. Help us, our families. Help our communities. Help us to reach those, Lord, that need this information, that very wicked and evil things are taking place right now. And help us work against it. Help us fight against it. We need your help because we are Laodicean in ourselves. We have the seeds, Lord, of sleepiness. And we need you to help us to wake up that we might be able to do the work that we need to do. Help us, Father. Help us because we certainly can't help ourselves. And we can't help our families. Give us the Spirit of God, Lord. Pour out your Spirit, Lord Jesus. And pour out your Spirit upon my brother, Eli, as he speaks and gives his testimony. And speak through us and speak through him. To us, that we might be able to understand and hear your voice. We thank you so much for hearing our prayer. We believe, Lord. Yes. We choose to believe. Amen. 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 See if this will work. Yeah, that works. Yeah, I think that works. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, gonna... put this one in my pocket. As long as it doesn't push up against the, it'll make a loud sound. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Do it the other way? Hold on one second. Let me turn it off first. Yeah. I think that's all right. You just flip it this way like this. Yeah, yeah, like that. Because it's going to be in your clothes. No, that won't. I don't think that'll work because it's on the outside. Hello? Hello? It's, it's not, it's no, not, that's it's not going to work. What about right there? Can you do it right there? I think I got it. I think I got it. Just put it right here. There you go. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we're good. There it is. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's start with prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together tonight and to just um, fellowship with one another on the Sabbath. Um, I pray that anything I share would be edifying and a blessing to everyone that's here. And uh, I thank you for everyone else that's spoken um, and all that we've gotten to receive. Um, we just pray that your spirit would abide with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, so yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you to uh, Jeremy for inviting me, and thank you guys all for staying. Um, you know, I believe that usually when you speak to anybody who's come into the faith, um, you're going to get uh, a story or something that you didn't expect. God has very 
unique and interesting ways of reaching his people. And, um, and I'm, I'm always amazed when I hear other people's testimonies, so I don't, um, you know, uh, think that I have one that is any more or any less special than anybody else's. I think everyone that comes to God um, has a very special story to tell. Um, but I'm honored for the opportunity. And I think given the talk that was just given on Halloween and the connections to Hollywood, um, you know, what I have to say about my story in particular, there is some connections there. Um, so I, I'll start because I have some time. I've never really gotten to start really at the beginning. Um, so I'll kind of start with where I kind of briefly go through where I came from and then uh, how I ended up here. And, um, you know, hopefully you guys find it interesting. Um, and more importantly, hopefully it, it helps somebody. Uh, so I was born in Canada, and um, I lived in a home, in a single parent home, well, kind of. I was, my dad wasn't there, and my mom was there, but because I had five brothers and sisters, I was also, uh, as a small child, I was in foster care uh, a little bit, and um, that was a real blessing because that was the first introduction to Christianity that I ever actually got to experience was my foster mother who I who's passed away now but I really consider her to be like uh, like God had given me two mothers uh, to kind of walk with me and, and help me uh, in this life and I'm, I'm very grateful for that um, so being as a young child I was kind of into trouble I never really associated with Christianity or anything like that um, you know, my family was very secular. We would, you know, keep, celebrate Christmas, and, but we'd also celebrate Halloween. We would go out and trick or treat. We did just very secular in our mindset. Um, and when I was about five or six years old, um, I believe the way I remember it is that my mom was having guests over, you know, just like, not a party, but just like some people visiting and entertaining. And uh, one of them was a, uh, producer at a local television station. Um, they had just started and they were doing some like little associate producing um, and they were at the the station CBC which is you've probably heard of the BBC and that's the Canadian version. All the Commonwealth has, has those. So they have them in Australia and all over the world. Um, and so while she was there I guess she was looking for someone because they were doing uh, she was producing for Sesame Park, which is our version of Sesame Street. And uh, yeah, they're, they're all over the world. They got one in, in Mexico. They got all these different Sesame Streets all over. But um, while she was there, they were looking for young people that could sing and dance. And at that time, I was like, I wanted to be Michael Jackson. That was my, like, in my childhood mind, I thought you could actually grow up to be Michael Jackson, <laughs> not just be like him. So in my head, I, I, that was like, everything for me. I used to sing and dance in the mirror and so she asked my mom if I could, uh, if I could do it and my mom basically let me choose and, and that's how I got into uh, television and acting and things like that. And um, I kind of would bounce in and out of it. I would do some acting and then go and try to be a basketball player and then do some more producing of little short films and then go and try something else and I was in, involved in a lot of different stuff and sometimes just getting into trouble. Um, but around the time I was finishing high school, um, I was realizing, okay, I kind of have a choice because at that time I was DJing. I actually had a radio show, a local radio show called the Big Black Rap Show. So you, you can see there's a <laughs> quite a trajectory <laughs> to where I'm at now. But um, yeah, so I was, I was DJing and I was doing all kinds of crazy, very um, worldly, very, uh, yeah, just, just wrong things, demonic things that I didn't realize were demonic at the time. And uh, at that time, I realized, okay, I have a choice. I could either go in, into entertainment or I could go um, into, you know, university in the regular track. And I got a job um, hosting a show called Street Sense, and it was paying me, you know, more money than I'd had at that age. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I think I'm, I'm done with basketball. I wasn't, my brother played semi-pro and I wasn't as good as him so I thought okay well that's if he didn't make it to the NBA then I'm probably not going to even make it that far so I gave that up and um, and then after that uh, I just said okay yeah I'm going to go make some money and then maybe I'll go back to school at some point but let me make this money first to you know take care of whatever I wanted to take care of 
also I had, you know, I'd left home at a pretty early age at about 17. So for some people that's young, for some it's not, but um, you know, I had to figure out how to take care of myself. So, um, so anyway, uh, I was, I was working, I was acting on, uh, on street sense and hosting. And, um, when I finished that, I was still in my small town, uh, but my sister had invited me to come live with her in Toronto. Uh, so I moved up there and kind of had big dreams. That was kind of the LA for Canada. And that was kind of my, you know, big pursuit of, of my dreams of being a star, so to speak. And, um, and I moved there, and I was really just not very good at my job. I wasn't a very good actor. I didn't have a lot of skills. I hadn't gone to school for it. And so I didn't have a lot of success. I was mostly doing commercials. I did like a KFC commercial and a uh, you know, car commercial, and I was kind of getting frustrated. I was there for a couple years. Um, and kind of in the background of that, I always had this dream to go to Africa because that's where my father was from, and I knew that my, I had family there that I had never met. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to backtrack one quick second. So at one point in my childhood, just to kind of give you guys a sense of where I was at spiritually, uh, my mom had a book on the bed and I was about 13 years old and I, I came in the room and I think she was putting away some clothes or something like that. And I said, uh, mom, who's Holly Bibble? And then she said, no, no, my, my, my heathen son, this is, it's Holy Bible. It's Holy Bible. <laughs> That's how little I knew about anything religious. I literally had never, I, I don't even think I'd seen a Bible before, let alone, and I, and I certainly didn't know what it was. Uh, it just had big letters. And I was like, who's Holly Bible? She must be really important to have this big book and that, you know, her name fully there. So. Um, so that's what I knew of the Bible. So flash forward again, you know, I'm doing commercials. I'm living in Toronto and not having much success in my career. And I get a commercial, um, and, and I'm also thinking about possibly going back to university because things just haven't been working out. So I'm thinking about moving home, going to school, and there's this program called uh, the Foundation Year Program where you read a bunch of books about the Western culture's foundational books for one year, and then it upgrades you and you can go into your course that you want to take. So I was thinking about doing that, and they had a full reading list. And um, I'm, I'm having this dream of going to Africa, and a friend of mine says that she's going, and if I wanted to travel with her, I could, but I didn't have any money. And, um, and then I book a commercial, and it was really not supposed to be a big payday. It was uh, one of those like, you know, workplace safety things, uh, you know, and they tell you, you know, be careful when you're in the kitchen and wear your right shoes and all that stuff. And I didn't even have any, I didn't even speak, I don't think. But um, the cool thing about it was it was translated into like eight, eight or more languages. And every time in Canada that I have a rule, every time it gets translated, you get paid again as if. Wow. It, and so I got this big check that I wasn't expecting. And my friend was going to Africa. And I'd always wanted to go. And my career wasn't really doing anything anyway. So I just, it wasn't that much money. But to me at the time, it was like a lot of money. You know, it was like $3,000, which wasn't like, a lot of money, but at that time it was like a million dollars, you know. So, uh, so I took that money and I went to Africa, and you can just know the difference in the economy today compared to then, because I stayed in Africa for five months on three thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I mean, you couldn't do that today. That was, you know, that was two thousand and that was a while ago. That was almost that was almost ten years ago. So. Um, but anyhow, so I went to Africa, and while I'm over there, I was like, I want to read something because I'm going to be traveling, and I'm going to be staying. I was backpacking, so I'm going to be staying in hostels and things like that. And, um, and so I wanted something to read while I was traveling, and I had this foundational year book, and one of the books on it was the Bible. And, uh, and I knew my mom had that big Holly Bibble. So I was like... I was like, Mom, can I borrow, you know, can I borrow the, your Bible, the family Bible? And uh, she was like, just make sure you bring it back. Even though she wasn't religious at that time, it was still, it was important to the family because she had been at one point. Um, she had actually been disfellowshipped. Uh, and I won't say too much because it's my mom's private life, but uh, because I will say that because of all of us kids and, and our, the da our dad, my dad not being there, the church had uh, taken exception and chosen to disfellowship her. Um, it wasn't an Adventist church, but it was, uh, but yeah, so I knew that was very painful. Um, and I, like I said, I'll leave that. Um, but 
but she still had her Bible. And, um, and so she let me take it, and I went to Africa, and I was completely agnostic. I was thinking about going into sciences, but I was reading this Bible, and anyone, I don't know, do we have anyone here from Africa? Anyone, any African, no? Okay, mostly Caribbean. Your father's from Africa, okay, okay, me too. So if you've been there, you know, and it's probably similar in the Caribbean, people are very passionate about faith, whatever faith, whether it's voodoo, whether it's uh, Muslim, whether it's Christian, they're very passionate people about their, what they believe. And so when I was going around traveling with this gigantic family Bible, people would stop me and talk to me and want to ask me questions about religion. And I didn't know anything about religion. I just started reading. And so I met some very interesting people. Um, and I met one guy, his name was Emmanuel. Uh, and he was a Catholic, actually, but he took me to church with him, to his Catholic church. And at that time, I was a, a big Kanye West fan. And, uh, and I saw that he had a rosary. Sorry. And I thought, oh, man, that's cool. That's like Kanye West, you know? I was like, can you show me what, you know, can you give me, that? it was a black rosary. And he said, yeah, here you go. And he, and he showed me how to pray with his rosary. And I, and I saw that was the first prayer that I ever knew was to pray with a rosary. And so I had now this rosary in this Bible. I'm traveling around. And then I was traveling, you know, to kind of move forward a little bit. I was there for a few months, and I was going to travel outside. I was in Ghana, but I was thinking about going to Burkina Faso and, and some of the surrounding nation, uh, countries. And so I had my bicycle, and I had this kind of huge traveler's backpack. It was like a piece of luggage as a backpack. And, um, and I got a bus up to the border, and I was going to bicycle from there. And while I was on the bus, um, I ran into one guy while I was traveling up that way. And he was a missionary. A low, he was from Africa, but he was doing missionary work in Africa. And he sat next to me, and you know, he asked me what's my faith when he saw the Bible. And I said, no, I'm not, a, I'm not a Christian. I'm just reading this for a reading list. And he said, well, I'm going to pray that you find your faith. And I said, OK. <laughs> See you later. Uh, and then while I was continuing to travel, another guy came on. And this guy seemed nice. He, was, uh, he said he was a teacher. He was traveling up north. He had just finished working. He was taking a little break, and he was going to visit his family. And we were sitting on the bus for about four hours, and I told him what I was doing. And um, after I got to where I was going, he said, well, you know what? Rather than staying here in this town, you should come. We, I'm getting a, a taxi to an uh, area that's much closer to the border crossing. It'll save you time in the morning. And there's a, a YMCA you can stay at right there. And uh, I said, yeah, you know, this guy seems like a nice guy. So I, I went with him in his taxi. We drove out. And now we're leaving the kind of the main area, and we're in the bush. We're in the very north of Ghana, and there's no street lights. There's no nothing. It's just we're just on this one highway, single lanes, and we're about an hour outside of the town. So uh, I get there, and there is a YMCA there, but the YMCA is closed. So he says, well, it's OK. You can come stay with me and my family for tonight. And then, you know, we'll take you, we'll take you in the morning to the border. So I said, OK. And uh, so I go with him. And now we're going off. So there's a highway here. And then it's just bush on either side. It'd be kind of like here. We're in the country. You know, you go on a dirt road, you can go for miles. And so we leave the highway and we go off, except there's no dirt road. There's no road at all. We're just walking into bush. I have my, bike, my bicycle, my backpack. And I'm walking. And we're walking for, you know, a good 10 minutes. Probably felt more like a half hour, but it was probably only about 10 minutes. And we get there, and there's a, you know, they, they live in a house that's like a, it's a mud house, but that's how the houses are in certain areas, and that's okay. Uh, and they had a fire pit going, and it was 13 brothers and sisters. And, um, and then I started to get a weird feeling, because they started saying certain things. He started speaking in his own language, and the mother would say little bits of English that I could pick up. She would say, you know, American? And he would say, no, 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 Canadian. And then they'd speak their language, and she'd say, it's OK, it's OK. And I'm thinking, what does that have to do with anything? And then she said to me, did you bring something for us to eat? And I thought, no, I didn't bring anything for you to eat. And then she said, oh, it's OK, we'll find something. And it started to get very creepy. And so at that point, I said, OK, I'm going to get out of here. And so I just quickly took my bicycle, took my backpack, and started walking. And they, and they were started laughing. And it was very, at that point, I'm like, you know, my heart's pounding. I'm scared. I'm walking, I'm walking. Now I'm running with my bicycle, trying to get back to the, 
highway. And he said to, and he calls out after me, the guy I was on the bus with, there's no point in running, my brother's going to get the, the moto. And the moto, which is what they call the motorbikes. And so at that point, I jump on my bike, it's pitch black. And anyone who's been in the bush out there, it's, it's flat, but there's bumps and there's bushes and there's different things. And so it's amazing. I always thought it was, now looking back, I always think it was really God's hand that kept me from falling or hitting a ditch or flipping because I was going as hard as I could trying to get back to where we came from. And about, you know, a minute or two into my bike pedaling, I hear, and this person's trying to start their motorbike. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe this is happening. What's going on? These people are crazy. And I'm out here in the middle of nowhere in Africa. Instantly, I'm realizing how stupid I was for trusting someone I had I'd never met. I only knew for four hours, but I didn't, you know, I was young and I didn't know. So I, I'm biking, I'm biking, and I get to the main road, and it's, it's the highway, and there's one street light, there's a building here with the YMCA on top, and then there's a, what they, I think they call it a chop house, which is like a corner store, but it's built into the ditch. And there was two guys sitting there, and now I hear the, the moto, and it starts. So I can hear it off you know, where I just came from, and I'm like, I run up to these guys that I see sitting there, you know, totally panicked, covered in sweat. I'm like, there's people, I think they're after me, I think they're trying to get me, I don't know what to do. And the guy just points across the street, and I'm like, and it's a police station. So I'm like, oh gosh, okay, thank God. So I didn't say thank God at that time, I was just like, great. So I ran across the street, I banged on the door, and they had, you know, a shh, one of those kind of things, and he, shh, he opened it, and he said, we're closed. Yeah. Shh. Back. <laughs> and I said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm Canadian. I'm not from here. These people, I think they're trying to kill me. And then he said, shh, put a gun out. Closed. We're closed. <laughs> shh. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I ran back across the street to the, to the guys in the ditch. I said, I need help. These people are coming. And now I'm hearing this thing. You know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm hearing this motorbike getting closer and closer. And so I'm, I'm like, I need help. I, is there any place I can go? Is there any place I can stay? And they point. And uh, to the where the street kind of ends, and then the next street goes up, and I'm assuming that's the street that goes to the border crossing, and the the, the street lights right on the corner, and there's like a little path off the corner, and I'm like, I'm not going down there. There's no light. There's no nothing. I'm like, I'm not going down there. And then he's just like, he points over there again, and at this point, I hear, I do hear the motorbike very close, and I'm like, okay, so I back on my bike, book it to that little uh, creepy place, and. <laughs> I'm on this little path, and there's this little boy on the path, and he has a bike. He's walking his bicycle. He has no front wheel. It's just a, it's just a back wheel, and he's walking his bicycle on this path. And I, I run up to him. I must have terrified him, because he couldn't have been more than like eight or nine years old, little kid. I'm just like, hey, kid, do you know they told me there's somewhere I can go around here? I'm terrified. I think there's people trying to kill me. And the little kid's just like, oh my gosh, who's this crazy guy? And I'm like, I swear I'm a nice person, but please just help me. <laughs> you know, and, and he points in an area further down the path, and I'm like, I'm not going over there by myself, will you come with me? I, I, was, I, I did, I'm, I, you know, I'm ashamed now, but you know, I was scared. And, uh, and he said no, <laughs> as any eight-year-old kid should say. And I said, please, I'll have money, I can give you money, but you know, I just need you to help me. So he, he does, he walks me over, I go to give him a um, 100 Ghana CD, they had just changed over their <coughs> currency to the Ghana CD, so it was about $100 American. And, uh, and he wouldn't take it. I said, no, 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 it's okay. He said, he said, no, 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 I won't. And he didn't take it. And he left. And at this point, again, now I hear the tro tro in the same, the moto in the same area I just was, but I'm off this path. And there was a, a hostel there, so I run to the, into the hostel. I bring my bike, I bring my backpack. And the guy running the hostel, he is like, you can't bring your bike in here. You can't bring your backpack in here. And I'm like, listen, you don't understand. There's people trying to kill me. I need to stay. I need everything in here. I don't want them to know where I'm at. And he's like, I'm sorry. So I call the woman who I had been staying with in Accra, which is the capital city. And I said, Antiaco, that's what I called her. I called her my auntie, but she's not actually my auntie, but I called her Antiaco. I said, Antiaco, you know, there's people after me. I don't know what to do. Um, and this guy won't let me bring my stuff in here. And she said, let me talk to him. So I give him the phone and the phone cuts out. I'm like, oh gosh, this is getting bad, you know? And then thank, you know, thank God now I can say that it rings. And I'm like, hello? And she's like, I put credits on your phone. Give, give the phone to the guy. And I didn't know you could do that. In Ghana, you could add credits to someone else's phone. So I gave him the phone, and she talked in, in their language. And then 
he was cool, you know what I mean? And, and then he was like, okay, but it's gonna cost you more, whatever. I was like, I don't care, whatever it costs. And he was like, it's gonna cost 300 Ghana CD for the night, which is astronomical. But I paid the money, because I was scared. And so I went into the little room that I had, I put my giant backpack on the bed, I, I'm like listening to hear this moto coming down this pathway any second. I open up my backpack and right on top is the Holly Bibble. And I'm like, holy Bob, of course. And so I pick it up, I open it, and I'm like, I only learned how to pray with the rosary. So that was the prayer I knew. So that was the prayer I prayed. And I prayed, I say, and at that time I said, God, and I'll say this, I felt a presence at that moment that I never felt. I was all alone. And I came from a big family and, and, and was in foster care, so I had a lot of family. But I'd never really been alone. But at that moment, I was all alone, and I didn't feel all alone. And that was like, that was, that was the first bit of comfort that I had. And so I said, God, I don't know if you're real, but if you're real and you get me out of this, I will try to find out everything about you that I can. I'll try to find out more and more about you. Uh, I, I, I promise that. Oh, God bless you. Thank you. And so I stayed up and I prayed all night. I didn't sleep. I was so scared. I was like, I'm going to die out here. And as the sun started to come up, I started to get calm. And I went out of the room. I packed it up. And I saw the guy. And I'm like, man, this guy hustled me, man. He took advantage of me. I, you know, all right, bye. And I went to the border crossing. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm almost forgetting. You know, I'm almost forgetting the prayer. I'm, almost, I'm already just like, Eli, you were tripping. You know what I mean? Like, this was not real. And my, my phone rings. And I pick it up. And I'm like, hello? And it's my Antiaco. She says, what's going on? Are you OK? Did you make it? I said, oh, I'm sorry, Antiaco. I'm sorry I scared you. It was nothing. I was probably just tripping. She said, no. She said, I didn't want to tell you this last night because I didn't want to scare you. But the area, and this is a quote. So anyone from Ghana that's online or anything like that, you can take it up with her, because this was a quote from her. She said, I wouldn't have gone to the area you were in if the president had escorted me himself. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was a lot of people that were rebelling against the government in those areas. There was rebels, and, and they, sometimes they would do things to tourists. They would sacrifice them to do lots of, lots of things. And a lot of them follow voodoo practices and things like that. And, um, and she said, I wouldn't, and it instantly flashed back to me what I had promised God. And I said, okay, okay. All right, this is the beginning. So from there, I went and traveled, and I was continuing reading my Bible, but now I started to see things. Because even when I'd opened it up, I thought, I'm going to read this Bible, but I'm not going to judge it, or else I'll never get through it. It wasn't a religious thing, but now I think the Holy Spirit must have put that in my mind to say, to say that to myself. But I just thought, if I, if I read this with criticism the whole time, I'll never finish it. So I was like, let me just read it and judge it when I'm done. But now... I was reading it, and God was just showing me so many things, like little things that would stand out to me. So like the conflict in Israel uh, between the Muslims and the, and the Jews, how that, was, how that was already in the Bible said that that would always be the case. And I thought, man, that's been thousands of years, and how could it have known that? There were so many conflicts that it could have said that about. And it, and, but it was true, you know? And, and I'm reading, and I'm reading, and I'm seeing all these little things. Um, sca the term scapegoat. And I'm like, scapegoat? That's, that's a, I've heard. So it was little things that were just standing out to me. And I read the entire Old Testament. And I was there for five months. And I, now I started to appreciate godly things. And I started to talk more about them. But I still wasn't a Christian. I didn't know if uh, Judaism was the real religion, Islam. I didn't know if it was Christianity. I just knew that the Bible was really written by God. And I thought, this is interesting. So I got back to Canada. And with this kind of fresh in my mind, and um, I ended up, long story short, I started to take my career more seriously. I said, if I'm going to do this, let me really focus on it. And I started doing theater. I started practicing and studying and um, just really working on my craft. And, and I started getting better at, at, my, at my work. And um, I started being more successful. So I booked a sh one series and then another series. And then I booked a series about a gospel choir. And I was playing a, a tenor in the choir. And um, the producers uh, were Christian. And so I had been reading the Bible, but one of the things that stood out to me, I was like, there's something wrong with Christianity because everyone goes to church on Sunday. But the Bible 
I'd only read the Old Testament, but the Bible clearly says that Sabbath is the holy day. So I was, I was really confused about that. And so I was sitting in the, in the van, coming back from set, going to the hotel one day with Andy, uh, who was the producer of the show. And I said, uh, hey, man, I was just wondering, you know, uh, if it's bothering you, don't, you know, don't worry about it. But I just wondering, why do Christians go to church on Sunday when the Bible says it's supposed to be Saturday? And he said, well, well, my church doesn't go to church on Sunday. And I was like, oh. And he's like, yeah. And that now I know, looking back, <laughs> he was probably in his head like, God sent this young man. I'm about, to, I'm about to evangelize him. But to me, I was like, man, Andy's mad cool, you know? So, uh, so he's like, yeah, you know what? When we get back to Toronto, because we were actually shooting in my hometown, and, and then we were going to go back to Toronto. He said, when we get back to Toronto, I'll tell you what, why don't I come pick you up, and I'll take you to my church. You can check it out. Because I told him I'm you know, looking, but I'm not sure where I want to be. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. I really appreciate it. So we got back to Toronto. He took me. It was Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm. And um, instantly, I just was like, this is, this is what I read. Mm. It just matched up, the way people carried themselves, you know. And again, this probably, this was a, 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 a not, I don't want to say offshoot because that's the wrong word, especially right now. It was a church that had been started by the young adults from a more uh, seasoned church. And so compared to what a lot of people would consider now, they would, yeah, they would consider it pretty liberal as far as church goes. But to me, coming out of the world, yes. it was impressive just to see people wearing suits and taking themselves seriously and being concerned about what they were eating and reading the Bible and then afterwards talking about the world and how it relates now to what the Bible said. I was just blown away. And so I was like, yeah, this is, this is, where I, this is a real church of the Bible. And so I started going, still wasn't baptized, and... I had bad, you know, different ideas about um, what baptism was about. I didn't really fully con conceive of what it really was. And so I, to honor my foster mother, who was the person who introduced me to, you know, church first, I was like, oh, I want to go back home, get baptized in her church, which was a Baptist church, and then I'll come back and keep going to the Adventist. Because at that time, I was like, you know, it does, it's no harm keeping Sunday. I didn't think, I thought it wasn't the right day, but it wasn't bad if someone invites you to go or something like that. I didn't realize it was the mark of the beast. So, you know, I went back there and, and my foster mother was, you know, I, I'm very, I, I would be very surprised if I don't see her in heaven. She lived up to all the light that she had. She was like a, an angel to me, um, treated me like her own blood. And, uh, and I'm always grateful to her. So I went back there and I got baptized in the Baptist church, and I was still going to Adventist church, still acting. Uh, again, long story short, I ended up in Vancouver, some things happened, and then I, my career kept moving up and up. Um, I ended up going to school and getting more training, and then I ended up in LA. And um, while I was in LA, I was going to a church, and I was doing some Bible studies with a brother, and he said, you know, you gotta get rebaptized." And I said, well, why would I you know, need to get rebaptized? And he said, well, because you know, you're not baptized into the faith that you actually believe in. And I said, you know what? That makes sense. So I got baptized in the Seventh Day Adventist Church at Valley Crossroads um, and in Pacoima. And around that time, I was acting, but I hadn't fully taken my stand on the Sabbath in my work. And so this was kind of the first conviction that I had, because you know, when you're a young actor starting out, your first roles is very a lot of pressure to just concede to what everybody tells you to do. And so I booked a show called The 100, and um, they were, I was talking with my managers and my agents, and I said, you know, I keep the Sabbath. I would like to get it in my contract. And my manager said, no, you can't, you know, you can't do that. The, you know, they got another guy. I was, so how they set it up is you audition, and it, you audition, audition, audition. Once you get to the top, it's you and maybe one other guy but they make you sign your contracts before they tell you who gets the job in order to keep leverage over you for negotiating. And so if you, they make it sound like if you make too much of a fuss, they'll just go with the other guy. And so I was like, ah, uh, they're like, trust me, don't do this. And so I said, I really want it. They said, I'll tell you what, we'll go to them, we'll tell them how important it is to you, and we'll see what they say. So they came back and they said, you know what, we won't put it in that he can have the Sabbath off officially, but we will make best efforts. I said, best efforts, that sounds, that sounds nice, that sounds good. And so I got the job, and we were shooting, and we were in uh, Vancouver, and uh, the first Friday night came around, and they said, 
And I said, okay, guys, well, I'll see you later. And they said, Eli, don't you know you got, a, you got a night scene tonight? I was like, what? So I ran to the producer. I was like, what's going on? Eli, sorry, man. You know, it's just the schedules, and this happened, and that person couldn't make it, and this and that. We really did make best efforts. We really tried, but just, you know, you're going to have to work tonight. And I had to work all night till the morning. And I was so tired, I couldn't even go to church the next day. And after that, they killed me off the show. <laughs> and it was an experience that I'm grateful for now because at the time it was devastating because not only did they do that, but I had booked a major role on a movie called Godzilla. And I booked another major role on a movie called the, uh, Divergent. And I couldn't do it because, and it, it would have made me, you know, a, like millions of dollars. And, uh, and they told me I couldn't do it because they had me under contract. Amen. And so, praise God. And, but at that time, it was devastating. And, uh, and so then when they killed me off, I was like, so you guys, lo I lost that job. And then you killed me and you didn't even need me, you know? So, and I missed the Sabbath. So it was just like everything. And at that time, I wasn't living right either. You know, to be perfectly honest, it was a... Uh, um, I was, I was inappropriately interacting with females. I'll say that because I think there might still be some children. And, you know, and it was just wrong, all the way wrong. So I was feeling con condemned about that, feeling like, did I mess up my own success? Because I didn't understand God's, you know, God's bigger plans. And then also, like, mad at the show, mad at myself. And so the next time I went back to L.A., I got another show, uh, a movie called Race. And I said... I'm not doing this show. I'd actually, what happened was I had tested for Star Wars against John Boyega. He got it, and I had to go back to Canada because my visa ran out. So I was already kind of in a bad place and thinking about leaving the business. And then um, I got this job on this, show called Ra on this movie called Race, and I was like, no, I'm not breaking the Sabbath. This is it. Take it or leave it. And what I realized is when you push back, they have a lot more respect for you. And they said, yeah, okay. And then one night, even though it was in my contract, they sent their, you know, there was a Jewish producer who was on the show and they sent him to my hotel room and they said, he said, I know about the Sabbath, you know, I'm Jewish, but we really need you to work. And I said, if you know about the Sabbath, you really shouldn't be here, you know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and that was that. And it, and, it, and it was empowering. So I was like, okay, I don't need to buckle to, to this industry. I can say what I want and I'll have more success. And that... You know, that was a great experience. Now, I was still living wrong, still going to church and still in the world, you know, but I was, I was starting to get a better sense of what I, what I could not couldn't do. And then, so I came back. I was living like that, working, not working, working, not working, keeping the Sabbath, but not living a, a Christian life. And fast forward, 2020 hit. And... I'll say, you know, I had been going, when I was in Vancouver, I didn't touch on this, but there was a church that I went to for a little while, um, Richmond Seventh-day Adventist Church with Elder Bill Wong and just a really great congregation. They were, they were, I would say, the closest thing to present truth that I had experienced. And even though that was very conservative and I wasn't living a conservative life at all, I still, something drew me there. I kept going back there. And there were other churches in Vancouver that were more liberal, but I just, something about that church, I just felt the presence of God there. And so when I was there, they had said, you know, brother, we, you know, we don't think you should go to Hollywood. We think it's, it, it is Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, you know, we, we just don't think you should go. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, this is what I do. I don't know what else I would do. And God will be with me. You know, maybe I can reach people in Hollywood and, you know, bring them to the gospel. Other people can't reach them. You know, all the rationalizations you give yourself. And, and I went to my, you know, my dad. Now I had met my family in Ghana. I, I didn't mention that. While I was there, I ended up finding my family, found my grandmother, connected me with all my family. And, and then when I came back, my dad's family and me reunited. And so that was a real blessing. And so, you know, just a long short of it. Uh, and so I went to my dad's church, and they prayed over me. And even my dad said, you know, I don't think you should go, but I'm going to pray that if you go, that God protects you and you have success. And so I, I ended up going. And, um, but I, when 2020 hit, I remembered that church, and there was a guy there named Israel. And 
he had tried to give me these DVDs, these Walter Weith DVDs. Because Walter Weith was really, he's, he's in Canada a lot. He's constantly in BC. And I'd actually met him and didn't even know who he was when I met him. And I had asked him some dumb question. I'd like challenged him on something he had said in my ignorance. And he just didn't argue with me. He said, okay, well, very good. And I was like, I don't like this guy. But, you know, and then I, and then I moved on. But then when COVID hit, I remembered the, that guy. And I remember they saying things about the government and how they were going to try and control people and how things were going to be different and pandemics and these types of things. And so I said, I'm going to go online and find this guy. And I found Total Onslaught. Oh, yes. And I watched the first one. And I was like, oh, man, it was just like I woke up. It was like I'd been sleeping Amen. and I woke up. Amen. And um, and so I watched the entire series in like a like a few days. And it's 36 hour long videos. I think I watched it in like three days. Like I didn't sleep. It was all I watched. Yeah. And so after that, I was like, OK. And at this time. Yeah, anyway, I won't, uh, for, for the sake of protecting other people, I won't go into all the details, but I needed to get things right. And so I was kind of you know, trying to figure things out. Um, but I'm now convicted about, you know, what he's saying is the truth. And I still had never, you know, I've been in the Adventist church all this time, but people have different ideas around Ellen White and the church. And so anytime someone would say to me, you know, you should read Ellen White, another person would say to me, man, don't read that. that you don't want to be, you know, and in my head, I was like, I read the Bible, I read it cover to cover, and I'm keeping the Sabbath, and that's Christianity. You know, and, and, and I don't want to get sucked into a false prophet. Meanwhile, the Bible says, test the prophets. Right. But I didn't, I didn't really, you know, the devil can blind you. Even though I'd read the Bible, he can blind you with certain things. And so I never read it. But I was watching Walter White, and then I booked another show. And this show, I read the, and this is a show that's, I can say this, this is a show that's out right now that I'm on, on Amazon, um, called The Peripheral. Peripheral. <laughs> and I booked this show, and... I think it was 2021. I, no, first I did One Night in Miami. One Night in Miami happened, and then COVID hit. And then I watched Walter Vyth. And so my career had really taken off. Wait, you was in One Night in Miami, right? Yes. That was the boxing. You that was, yeah, I played, I played Cassius Clay. And so that, like, was the pinnacle of my career, because that movie really hit. And so, and Regina King had just won the Oscar. And so I was, like, I was taking meetings with... Steven Spielberg's companies and, and all these people. And it's like, it was this weird double thing because I was, I'd finally gotten what I wanted and now I'm seeing this total onslaught, this total onslaught and, I'm no, and, I know that, and I know that it's true. And so it was like this, like, this weird thing of like, well, what do I do now? Because I just got my hands on my dream and now I know that it's, it's, it's Satan. Right. It's sin. And so I'm like, okay, so I'm doing these meetings. And so I, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, I got to work. I got to eat. I got to pay my bills. So I'm like, I booked a show, um, The Peripheral, and I'm reading the script. And there's so many things in there that are clearly a call, clearly Masonic, um, you know, just the agendas. And again, this is not to attack anybody because people may or may not know what they're doing when they're doing it. And a lot of times people just think it's the style or whatever. And, and the, Satan has ways of doing things to controlling people without them even being aware of it. But I see it, and I'm like, man, I, you know, I feel convicted about this. At the same time, I'm like, I gotta get out of the city, I wanna get out of the, I'm trying to figure out how, what's my transition out of the business now that I know some of the truth. At that time, I thought I, you know, I knew the real truth. And so I, I messaged Walter Weiss people, and I'm like, I'm thinking about doing this show, but you know, don't tell anybody, but you know, it's about this, this, and this, and I think I should, uh, you know, I don't know if I should take it or not. I'm going to take it so I can get money so I can leave, but should I take it? And no one got back to me, unfortunately, because uh, they're busy, you know, they don't have time for that. Uh, everybody messaging them, you know what I mean, about personal stuff. You got to go to God for that kind of stuff. But after that, I messaged a Sunday person. The Sunday person was like, well, as long as it's not your role, you know, it's not, not a big deal, you know, just you can't control the whole show, just your character. And so I was like, Okay, okay, that's fine. And I, and I think in all sincerity, he, he was, he's still a good friend, but it's just his perspective. So, so I said, okay, I'll do this job, then I'll get my house, I'll move to the country, and then, you know, we'll see from there. So after I did, I did the show, and it was a terrible experience, they had one scene, 
I'll just give you a quick example. I'm, I'm laying on a table. First of all, the whole scene is about recreating man. They're making an android body of mine for the future. I'm laying on this table, and I already know what they're going to try and do because they want to shoot me from the top while I'm laying down with the camera. So I'm like, they're going to, and they're making, and my body's being created. So they're going to make, I already know, knowing that this show is a cult, that they're going to try and cut my face in half and only show one eye. And so I think, okay, well, if I keep my eyes closed, then they can't do that. And it matched up with the continuity from the time I'd been on the show, the shot, the previous scene. So I'm trying to fight with Satan on my own power right. and on his territory. And, I, and the director yells over to me, Eli, can we get your eyes open? <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, the producer's on set and I'm on this table and everyone's trying to get home. It's the last shot of the day. And I'm like, no, I don't think it matches up with continuity. And he's like, they go back and they talk to like, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, okay, good. But we just, we, just in case, just in case it's off, you know, blah, blah, blah. And rather than having this, con you know, the courage of my convictions and just saying, no, I'm not going to do that because I think you guys are Illuminati and I don't want to get, you know, caught up in this thing and have everyone in church see me. I'm like, okay. And I open my eyes, both my eyes. And of course, the, the next day, they clip together a little teaser, the very end of the teaser me with one eye open and half my face cut off. And so I go and say to them, hey, this doesn't match up with continuity. This isn't right, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I don't want this being shown. And they say, okay, we won't. Did they do that in post? Post, yeah. Post, right? Yeah, post. So, you know, they said, okay. And then a few months later, I messaged them again. I was like, just in case you guys didn't remember, you guys said that you wouldn't show this ever. But on my, in my own heart, my own soul, it doesn't matter if they show it. Because I knew what had happened. And there was other things that had happened like that to where I was like, for, I, I sat down with the creator of the show, the showrunner, and one of the stars. And I'm sitting there at the, you know, we're all doing kind of an orientation with just us. And then they say, you know, I'm a Jesuit. And so was he. And, and, uh, and, and he went to Je Jesuit school. And they started telling stories about how they used to do Jesuit mission trips and Jesuit. This is after Vite. And I'm sitting there, yeah, exactly. So you can imagine my mind. I'm like, oh, man, I'm surrounded by Jesuits. Who, the Jesuits wrote the show. And, and, I can, and I know this agenda of this show. I'm like, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here, you know? And so the show, we wrap that season. And I come back. And I'm watching more of Walter Weiss, watching What's Up Prof. And Stateline pops up. And I'm like, and I check Dr. O. And I'm like, oh, wow, where is this? And then I find out about Ardmore. And I'm like, that's where I'm going. So, you know, long story short, I really looked long and hard, found a place, and was like, okay, I'm going to Ardmore, moved over here, and so basically when I got here, immediately as soon as I got here, they needed me to go back for reshoots. And there's some more stuff happened. I can't say because it's the show and I, legally, you know, I don't want to be in trouble. But some more stuff happened that clearly was trying to disrespect this, the holiness of Christ and, and the Bible, in my opinion. And, and I voiced complaints, and they made small adjustments. But at this point, I was like, Eli, you know, what are you doing? Right. You're still fighting you, yeah, and so you know, I, I talked to my mom. I said, Mom, you know, I was thinking about I was going to buy this house. I was going to keep doing acting, make you know, my big. So they gave me, they, they always set it up so your money's always at the, behind aft, at the back end. You. It follows you. Yes, yeah. so <laughs> you had to make the choices first. And so uh, my money was. Yeah, exactly. And so I had gotten a good amount of money the first season, enough to buy a house. So it was a good amount of money. Um, but the big bump, I got a 50% bump in my second season if I did one more season. But the way the first season went, I said, if I do another season, I'm going to have to do things on that show that I'll never be able to look myself in the mirror again and say I'm a real Christian. I, I know it. Because it always gets worse. Every season gets exponentially more evil. Even if you watch, you know, uh, The 100, the show that I used to be on, it got worse and worse. It started off very innocent. By the end, they were crucifying people yep. on the show. So, you know, so I said, so, so it was a blessing that I didn't stay on that show. But anyhow, but, you know, I still have a lot of people that did the show, and I have a lot of respect for them. So anyone watching, you know, it's not anything personal. But it's just my spiritual convictions. I didn't want to be a part of that. So I knew I couldn't do the second season of this show. And because I'm under contract for four seasons, I couldn't do any other shows unless I did this show. And so I'm talking to my mom, and you know, I'm telling her these things I'm telling you. 
And she says, you know, Eli, from the sounds of it, you know, the devil's just got you totally wrapped up. And you just got to get out of that. And I was like, but mom, like, I had a plan. And she's like, you had a plan, but God had another plan. And I was like, but what am I going to do? I got this mortgage. I got this and that. She's like, I mean, this is what you say. This is what faith is, right? And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray about it. And, and I'm going to ask God. And so I pull up to church. The next day was Sabbath after I talked to her. I pull up to church in the parking lot. And I pray and I said, God, you know, I, I don't know what to do. Like, this doesn't make any sense. If I leave this job, I don't have enough to cover everything that I've already invested in. And I'm, my career is just taking off. Like, if I could do one more year, I could have enough money to live. I had a podcast going. I had a movie deal I, was, I had written. Uh, like, I had so many things that were, I would be good for forever, probably. God, you know, God permitting. Um, but I always thought about that, that parable of the man who laid up everything in store, and he says, thou fool, this night thy life is required of thee. And so I was thinking about all these things. I'm praying in my, in my truck. And, uh, and I go into church, and Dr. O preaches a sermon. I thought he was outside waiting for you. No, he preaches a sermon, and it was all, and he says up there, he says, I don't know who I'm preaching this for, but someone needs to hear this. And he preached it all about Hollywood. And he preached it, and he said, and if someone doesn't make a decision today, it might be too late tomorrow. And I said, okay, that, that was very clear. That was very clear. And, um, and so after that, I, I literally left church. I didn't even wait till after the Sabbath. I called my managers and my agents. I sent an email that night. And to everyone I'd been working with, I said, I'm retiring. And I you know, said the reasons why. And I said, you know, I hadn't been living right. I've been living half in the church, half in the world, lasciviousness and all kinds of nonsense. Uh, side note, Dr. O had prayed for me because I'd had issues with that for years. Since I was a small child listening to Snoop Dogg and Biggie Smalls and had this mentality of what manhood was in machismo. And I had been addicted to all kinds of lasciviousness. And I was worried at one point that I was going to get um, a disease. And I went and I got tested, but I, I was pretty sure I had it. And... Um, and I was concerned. I was like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, this could change my whole life. And I went to Dr. O, and he brought me in. And this is why I say his medical missionary uh, evangelism work, it's real. Because he prayed for me. And he said, never again, right? And I said, never again. He said, never again, right? I said, never again. And I felt healed. I got the results the next day. I was totally, I was totally clean. And since it was like something broke, since that moment, I haven't had any issues with it. It was just like it was just gone. Praise um, the Lord. Yeah, and so, and, yeah, and so anyhow, but to bring it back, I, I messaged my management team, I messaged everybody, and, uh, and I left the business. And, and so that's, you know, my story to how I got to be here and the, and the journey God's taken me on. And um, obviously, I've now read a lot of Ellen White. That's another thing I'd left out. When I was in England shooting the show, I started reading Ellen White. I was reading Adventist Home. Adventist home. Adventist home, and and uh, and that was totally convincing and convicting that she was a true prophet, yeah. because she was speaking to things that were in my own life that I knew to be true, Amen. and so um, you know there's lots of things that she prophesied that anyone can look up and say, oh, she has to be a prophet, but what really convinced me was the things that I knew in my own heart, just like when I read the Bible, you know, when when you read it and it convicts you on your own life, that's when your faith. I feel like that's when it really tells you this is real. Um, and so anyhow, that's how I got to where I am today. And um, praise God. I'm very grateful. And I don't regret it at all. It's the best decision I've ever made. Amen. Praise, Amen. praise Amen. Jesus. Yeah. That's exactly what he did. He yes. Faith yes. And, I, and I'll tell you another story later about something else that happened. I didn't have time. But sure. time being what it is, 7 o'clock. Um, if there are any, any, tell you the story. Okay, so when I was in when I was in Halifax shooting the the Christian show before I was ever went to an Adventist uh, church, I had been doing some craziness the night before. I went to a club and you know did some crazy stuff and um, very disrespectful stuff. And um, got back to my condo and I just had a flash of my life before my eyes, and I saw myself as an old man, and I was ashamed looking back at my life, 
I thought I have nothing to be proud of. My whole life was a waste. And at this point, like I said, I didn't know which, which version of what people believe was true or wasn't true. I didn't know if I was Christian or Islam or whatever. But I was like, even if there is no heaven, I just thought, what a waste of life to live like this. And I prayed. I said, God, I didn't know about you know, accepting the righteousness by faith. I didn't know that we have to uh, have Christ's righteousness imputed. I just said, God, I want to be righteous. I said, I don't want to live a life for the rest of my life and then look back and it was just for nothing. It was a, it was a shame. It was, it was embarrassing. I said, I want to be righteous. I want to have a life that I look back on when I'm older. And if I have grandkids or kids or, or family, I can say, you know what? I, I, I offered something to the world. I didn't just take from the world. And uh, again, this is something I think God must have sent into me to say and think um, because after that, you know, I, I was still living reckless, but I always remembered it. And so when I came to the present truth and realized like about Christ's imputed righteousness and when I, in, in these types of things, it, it, uh, it only convicted me again that, okay, this is, this is possible. And when I realized, you know, learned about Christian perfection and, and all these types of things and how we have to be obedient and the last day church is gonna have to be fully obedient mm -hmm. with no intercessor in order to be brought to heaven, it just all made sense to me. And now, you know, that I know, knowing heaven is real for as long as I've known now, now, of course, my ambition is for heaven. Right. It's not just to just be righteous just for whatever reason. But at that time, you know, I felt like God had put that in my heart. And when I got back to Toronto, and, and if you ever talk to my sister, she can testify to this because I was at her house on Eglinton Drive, and I said, I was in her house, and I heard God say in my head, obviously, you're going to have to be humbled. Mm. And I thought... I hate that. <laughs> and I was like, I got in her car and we were driving somewhere. And I said, B, God told me, I said, I told God I wanted to be righteous. And he told me I'm going to have to be humbled. And I hate that. And she said, wow, that's a great thing. I think that's wonderful. That sounds good to me. And I, but something about it, I, it wasn't like I was like gregarious or, you know, I'm still, I was just like I am now. But it was just, I, I knew deep down how prideful I am in my own heart. And something about the way I heard that it spoke right to the, it breaks you down. It spoke right to the core of me. And so that was something that was another experience that I had. Um, but yeah, but anyhow, uh, God just says, you know, I'm very grateful to Jesus and, um, and God for everything, to Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit for everything that they've done. Um, and yeah, so if you have any questions, any questions? I got a question. So yeah. on the flip side of what you did in Hollywood, you got an experience in, um, in film. Yeah. In creating. Yeah. Would you now do it on the flip side? So, you know, I thought about what, right now, like I said, I'm under contract. Yeah, I know you're still in. For a while. So if I was going to do that, I'd have to be released from my contract, which they might do because I've retired. You're talking about independently. I understand, but you, the way the contracts work, oh, okay. you, you know, you're under contract, you're under contract. But, I mean, I could do something where it was a documentary or something, but I couldn't do anything that was in any way uh, seen as acting, acting right, right. because that would be right. a no, violation. But even still, you know, when you're, it's almost like if you were a drug dealer, you probably wouldn't want to become a pharmacist right away. Right. You know what I mean? Because it's like it's a little too close, and you don't want to be drawn back, you know? So it's like I, I think... For me, like, I just came out of it, and I'm letting God lead and show me what's next. But I don't, you know, I don't know if, I don't really think I'm in a position to, to do anything except learn and, and, and build myself up. Even this, like Ellen White talks about, you know, not having unbelievers be at the head, giving, you know, doing too much. They should really be underneath learning. And so, you know, even this, I did it because I think it was, might be beneficial to some people that want to know more about Hollywood because it seems so flashy and glitzy and especially with the young people, they're so enthralled by it to just show them. You know, I've had a friend, Jack Knight, who murdered himself this year. He, w he had a full deal with, with, uh, with NBC. You know, I worked with um, Robin Williams' daughter on a show, Robin Williams murdered himself. You guys all know these people. And, so and even when the ones who don't murder them, you can see they're not happy. Yeah, right. So, you know, just to let people know that this business is not what it appears to be, and even if you are happy, even if you do have some form of worldly happiness, when Jesus comes, it's all going to burn, and it's not going to be That's worth right. it. So, um, right here. I was going to say, so you think that you're right now in the stage where you are still being humbled, meaning that you're not 
touching any of these things, at least for some time? I, yeah, yeah, I'm always going to be in the state of being humbled until we're in, until we're in heaven, I, I hope. Now I look at it as a very, you know, look, I, did, I should have said that. Now looking back, I'm grateful that, I'm, that God humbles me because if he didn't, you know, how wicked and sinful I am. It's like, what would I do, you know? So it's, it's really a blessing. But, um, but yeah, as far as the, the second part of your question, um, what was it again, sorry? Yeah. And that's what happened to me when I was in music. I, had, I, I made the decision to completely step away from music for like three years. And I had no intentions of, of bringing it back. Yeah, yeah. It would have to be God would have to lead. Like, I did have ideas for things that I think would be relevant to the Seven Day Adventist message. Um, but it would ha I'd have to have full creative control, and that's very difficult. Um, yeah. Just in case your folks can't hear nobody else. No worries. Yeah, yeah, good point. So he was asking me if, if, there was, uh, if I needed to take a full break from the industry uh, before I do anything Christian-related. And I would say, you know, God has to lead. But um, God, God has to lead, but there are ideas that he's given me. And if I had full creative control, which is very difficult to get, um, I, would, I would consider it. But it would, have to, it would have to be a very specific circumstance. Like, I, had, oh, I, I thought about producing Pablo Goya's testimony, for instance, because I heard his testimony about living in, it's, I mean, it's amazing if you've heard it about living under communist uh, government and uh, his father and the miracles that they saw in that time of trial. So that's, some, that's a story that came to me. I was like, man, if I was in the business and I had full creative control, I would love to make that story because I think that would be a blessing to people. But at the same time, you know, you just got to be very careful because the devil is subtle I'm gonna, yeah, and can I'm lead gonna, you back. I'm going to come back and talk to you about that because We'll share some yeah, yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, from you working on uh, the cast of One Night in Miami, uh, now that you've left, right, mm -hmm. do you have any contact with the other three uh, main characters from that movie? Um, so when I left, I was, you know, I talked to Leslie, I talked to, um, I didn't talk to Aldous as much. Uh, Aldous just came out with Black Adam, you guys probably just saw a lot of that. Um, but I talked to Kingsley, um, and they've always been very, very kind to me, very, you know, uh, genuine, um, you know, but you, you do see things. When you're, when you're in this industry, the industry is run by the occult. And so even if people don't realize what they're doing, and I think some people do realize what they're doing, they have to capitulate yes. in order to get the success. And at first they, you know, you can feign ignorance, like I did. I was in the business, taking part in this stuff, but trying to find the middle ground and, try, and feigning ignorance. Like, I'm a Christian and I know what I believe and I'm not gonna do this and I'm not gonna do that and I still keep the Sabbath and, you know. And I had had people, you know, invite me to some worshiping cults and, and different things like that. And I'd been like, no, you know, I, I, I worship Jesus. But do you really worship Jesus? Because why are you here? Why are you here? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly, what are you doing here? And so, um, yeah, and, and so I think that was kind of the, the hypocrisy that I realized, which is like, you know, even things like I would tell my, my brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews, you know, don't watch TV, don't watch movies. But I'm in movies, and they're like, oh, we want to watch your movie, you know? And I was like, no, don't even watch my movie, you know? And so it's like, at a certain point, you know, the hypocrisy starts, and so that's the decision I made. Go ahead. Have you thought about using your producer skills to do something um, with Adventism or yeah, they just asked me that. Had I thought about using it to... I, I had thought about it, and um, right now, no, because I'm in the contract, and also, I just feel like it's too close. If God led me in the direction, and it was the right thing, uh, consider it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. What's that? Yeah. Absolutely. But here's, here's the other thing I want to say about that. I, I think sometimes we forget how the time is. And so, you know, saying, will I make a movie for Adventism presumes that we have years to make movies, do things and write scripts. And, but the time is very short. Jesus is coming soon. We don't know how soon. Many people in present truth Adventism believe the mark of the beast is going to be 24 plus or minus. You know, and I believe that. I'll be honest with you. From what I've seen, I believe that. Now, do I know for sure? No. 
But I do believe the mark of the beast is 2024 plus minus. And so, you know, the time is extremely short. We know that. And, and we, it, it's easy to, it's almost like when you're trying to wake up from a long sleep, you kind of fall back asleep and you wake up and you're like, I got to get to work. And then you're like, but I'm so tired, just 15 more minutes. I think that's the state we're constantly in of like thinking we have all this time and we're thinking about future things, paying off our mortgage, doing these jobs, doing these different things. But then remembering, oh yeah, but the time is short. I, I got to wake up because actually what I really need to be doing is just telling people the third angel's message, telling people about the sanctuary, telling people that Jesus is coming and you have to, you have to get your soul right with God and you have to accept Christ uh, by faith uh, and you have to allow him to do the work of sanctification in you unto perfection or else you're gonna, we're gonna, they're going to be lost. You know, that's just, that's, the, that's what the real pressing, urgent thing is. So when I say, you know, if God were to lead, maybe, it's a very, it's a very small maybe, because the truth is, I'll probably won't even be able to, I'll be more worried about buying and selling in the next couple of years than I will be about making movies, you know? Well, you don't have to make a movie. All you gotta do is get up and just witness to people and minister. That's it, that's it. Exactly. And that's what I'm hopefully trying to do tonight. Yes, yes, ma'am. So the, the man is, I'm just going to tell, praise God. So what she said was that I don't have to make a movie. I can just minister and, and tell people about the truth everywhere I go. And that can have a lot more impact. And I think that's the same for everybody. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, 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 sir. You know, there was a scene in the movie, I can't think of the actor's name, but he played uh, James, the, the, the role of James Brown. Yes, yes, Chadwick Boseman. Yeah, well, there was a chap, yeah. There was a, there the Black was, Panther, that's right. Right, right. There was a scene where, in that particular movie, that little Richard told him that at some point, there's, you're going you're gonna to meet a guy that's going to be all dressed in white. Wow. And he said to him in that movie, at that point, that is when your career is really going to pick up. I don't know if you, if you noticed that. I watched the movie. I actually auditioned for that movie. Mm. And I watched the movie. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about present truth at that time, so there's a lot of things that come back to me now. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this. I was thinking about James Brown just the other day because, oh, I hope I can remember this properly. There's something in, I want to say it's in Spirit of Prophecy, where she talks about pride and ego and she talks about how one will, how people would, it was a sin that they would kiss their own hand or something like that. And it instantly made me think of James Brown because that was his whole thing. Kiss myself. Make me want to kiss myself. And I thought, oh, wow. These are the little subtle things that the devil slides into the music, even way back in the 50s and things like that, that the devil will slide these sinful uh, impressions into the music. And, and Jeremy can talk all about that even more. Um, you know, I, we, we talked the other day how I, we were talking about Drake and, and how we didn't realize he was Catholic, Beyonce's Catholic, uh, if, you, if you look at the other half of their family. Um, and so, anyhow. Um, and, and again, not to say that Catholics all, are, you know, most Catholics are trying sincerely to follow God. However, we know that at the very top, the Pope, because we're here at the Reformation Day uh, seminar, the Pope is the Antichrist. The Pope is sitting in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Um, and so that whole system is the system of the beast. Um, was there any other questions? I just have one other question. Yes, sir. The other question is, many times when you see people working for the media or maybe a celebrity, are they communicating, you know, Jay-Z makes it very plain. He does this. Yeah, he throws up, throws up the diamond. The, uh, but, but I see even people within, even within the church yeah. doing it down low. Are they communicating when they're holding their hand? Very in a, they try to do it in a very subtle way. But many times oh, when they just stand there at the pulpit and they keep their hands like that? You know, I, I think a lot of that stuff is, so it depends on who it is. Because mm -hmm. right. some people are tied in, mm -hmm. and then other people are just looking at those people and yeah. trying to yeah. copy yeah. it. Yeah. Really? I was talking to a girl who um, was making a music video and she made the whole theme of the music video kind of like Egyptian and all this kind of you know, stuff. And I said, this was a couple years ago, I said, why, why did you make it like that? In my head thinking, this is, you know, this is demonic. And 
she said, well, that's, what's, that's the style. That's what's cool. That's what people want to see. And so I thought, oh, oh, that's why a lot of people do things. So I think some of the people probably hold their hands like that for that reason. But Jay-Z, uh, Kanye, uh, Drake, they, they are Mithraists. They believe in Mithra. They believe in the sun god. And, and it's all over if you watch. Like, Jay-Z wears a pendant of the sun. He talked about it on a show called The Breakfast Club, a radio station. He said, I, you know, I, uh, another man who calls himself Charlemagne the God. So, I mean, both of those names tells you what he believes. And he asked him, he said, you know, people don't ask you about your religion. And Jay Z was kind of coy about it, but essentially he said he believes he's a God. Kanye West has said he believes he's a God. Mithraism. And that's Mithraism, that you can work your way to being a God. And, um, and so that's what the Catholic Church was based off of. Um, and that's what the entire music industry, when you see these high level people, uh, they, they, that's what they believe. They believe that they can work themselves into being a God. Go ahead. I just want to thank, um, thank God for your testimony. It's really, truly encouraging. And I also want to thank God for allowing you to have an open mind when you, were, when you encountered the Bible and you, you read it. And, you know, God was just preparing the way for you, you know, all the while. Until God bless you. Until you actually accepted the truth. So the Lord was preparing you. And I want to thank God that um, just for allowing us to know that he's still in the same business. Glory to Jesus. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What you were talking about earlier about what was it, the commitments or trying to decide what you wanted to do, um, you know, that God will give you something better. Um, I struggled for many years with music. Mm. I'll be honest with you, I wanted to be a rock star. I had a good singing voice, mm -hmm. or I did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I tried it so hard that I thought I would go to Christian music. And it was like something always holding me back. I wasn't willing to sacrifice my soul to get it. And I, something told me if I were willing to go to nightclubs, I'd raise some damage, and I am. Mm -hmm. But it's like I could cross that line. But you know what? Even though I crossed that line, I wasn't doing the right thing either because I kept trying in other ways and eventually... I got out of more of rock music and more into the New Age style, and I was trying to write these things, and some of them were not really good. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, then I was doing music sampling and trying to come up with these really, you know, cool sounds. And then, and then eventually God gave me something better. It's like I didn't, I wasn't possessed with this. Like I have to keep creating, you know, creating this music or the sounds, and I don't have to keep being so, so. Um, and I have to keep going this direction. And then one day when I got to, you know, learn about the righteous of Christ, it's like, you know, I've been a Christian my whole life, but it's like I didn't really want to do those things uh -huh. anymore. And God gave me a different direction. You know, okay. he gave me a different direction. And Praise God. Me, so I'm able to follow my, my talents in other ways. Praise God. God. Praise God. You something better. You might not even miss, miss it because, you know, I, I, was, I never got done with my sampling business and the stuff never got finished. It never got sold. Praise and God. I, I didn't even care about it anymore because I had something better. Praise so, God. Yeah, I can still use this if I make videos and movies and, or stuff. I had the skills to do it, but praise I'm God. Not talking about me, but you know, God just took it away, and I was being rebellious for many years. Praise God. So, praise God. God. Me, I needed, he prevented me from having success. Well, let me tell you this, brother. I, I'll say this: God's already given me something better. You know, I have the truth, Amen. and I have the love of Jesus Christ, and I have the hope of salvation. So I really, that, I'll say this, I'm glad you asked that you made that statement because that was really the place I had to get to in my mind before I made the decision to leave the business. I had to go, okay, what if I can't pay my mortgage? What if I actually do lose, have to sell my house? What is the, what is the lowest I might have to get? I, I was sitting on the phone with my mom and I had to think about it. I said, can I live with that? Is it, is it okay? And if, and, and if I don't do it, can I live with the alternative? And I came to the decision in my mind I can live, you know, working at Chipotle, renting a room somewhere from some Adventist in the country. I can live with that. That's not going to kill me. I, I can be happy with that. I can, you know, but I can't live with looking at myself and wondering, is, do I have my soul anymore? Did I sell my soul to the devil? I couldn't live with that. And it was like the Bible says, what profited to the man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And so that was really, that was like, I slept all night thinking about that. And then the sermon the next day by Dr. Rowe. It just put the nail in it, and I said, yeah, that's, that's it. Yes. Sorry, sir. 
God, yeah. Go okay. Back. Okay. God bless you, sir. We, we got a question. Yeah, it's not so much a question. It's actually a comment how God has delivered you Amen. from that pathway. Yeah. Praise and Jesus. One of the problems you might gonna be having is not so much of the world, but even Seventh Day Adventists in our church mm. want to bring that to memory or into a different pathway in the same. Part that you're coming mm -hmm. from, yeah. to encourage you back into that life yes. path, in a sense. And you have to allow the Lord to lead you because what you're doing now is enlightening others Amen. from the path Thank you. That, you know, God has taken you out of that darkness. Thank you. And bringing Praise Jesus. The light. So you need now to testify of the goodness of God and yeah. the power of God yes. rather to go into any even so-called Christian yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, and because the yeah. whole thing is is laced with spiritualism and all the yes. things. Yes. And because we don't have the, the control that's right. to promote that. You have to go to the world for them to that's right. you know, audition certain things and, and give credibility to it for even that to be here. Yes, that's right. You know, so we just we're in a time right now that we have to get our personal heart together. That's it. And prepare for the crisis that is coming over. Yes, sir. So I, Thank I, you. We just need to pray that God has delivered this brother. And many of us have been delivered from darkness. Amen. And when God delivers you, you don't want the worst thing to come upon you. That's it. That's it. So That's it. You're in the right place now. Praise God. God Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. And brother, I just want to say this before we close. You're absolutely right. It has been, there have been several times when people in the church have come to me and, you know, I had someone talk to me just the other day about YouTube and, you know, how they knew someone. And I found myself, you know, because they said, well, I had an Adventist friend and they were they on YouTube and they're making this much and they're doing this and they just bought a house. And that triggered something for me because I'm always worried about my house, you know. And, and I was like, really? And then I was like, wait a minute. You know what? God bless them. I'm happy for them. But I don't need YouTube. Why would I do YouTube if I just... I could have had that if I wanted it. Why would I leave it and then go do something else? So the, the, the devil is very subtle. You said the right word. He's very subtle. And, I'm, and, and you're absolutely right. I, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Uh, Ellen White has in Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, she talks about the two crowns, the chapter of the two crowns. And, and one group of people was moving towards the worldly crown. And another was moving towards the heavenly crown. And, and people should read that chapter if they get a chance because we're closing. But, um, you know, it really spoke to, to me. So God bless everybody. Thank you so much. And let's just close with prayer before Jeremy comes up, if that's okay. Um, let's bow our heads. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just allowing us to come together and, and fellowship with one another and to, uh, and to share with one another. Um, God, I pray that this was in some way uh, helpful to leading someone to accepting Christ. Um, on, on Instagram who's, with the people watching or here. Um, and I just pray, God, that you would be with those who are still in Hollywood or in any industry because Babylon is not just Hollywood. He says, come out of the, it's the world. It's the world. And there's so many different places you can be in the world and be lost. And so we just pray that people would come out of Babylon um, and come into the marvelous light. Um, we pray that everyone would get home safely that's heading home tonight and uh, that the rest of this uh, great project would be blessed. And um, we just thank you for your love and your kindness. In Jesus' name, amen.